Flight is one of man's greatest achievements. Breaking the bonds of Earth requires the best of man's skill and ingenuity. governed by the laws of gravity. Sometimes the best laid plans go bad. When you are in a plane, there is no such thing as a small accident. When it starts hurtling to the ground at terminal velocity and it hits the ground, everything just completely explodes. If you sit and look at it long enough, it shouts volumes at you. That way you can tell which way it is, whether it's coming at you or going away from you. These are stories of those consequences. You know, that's what's left in my fuselage. You can't even tell this is an airplane. And of the men and women who strive to make the skies safer. This is what happens when planes go down. Teli Cornejo is an accident scene investigator for the National Transportation Safety Board. What remains here among the piles of twisted metal in the Mojave Desert is the end result of a not so normal day in the Melrose Fairfax district of Hollywood, California. The weekend was about to start in this area known for unique fashion and interesting people. Suddenly, down from the sky, tragedy. Still nervous from terrorist alerts, there was no hesitation. Emergency response teams from several agencies are on the scene immediately. down just one block from Fairfax High School, both federal and local agencies are called to the scene. The city is on high alert. Police immediately cordon off the area. We live in such a unique world after 9-11. Security and safety go hand in hand. And in the Fairfax incident, or the accident, uh, we were very concerned as to whether it was a safety issue or a security issue. And is it a safety accident or a terrorist incident? Let me Jack Weiss, Councilman. Jack Weiss, I'm glad you're here. It's up to the first NTSB investigator on site to control the situation until the lead investigator assigned to the accident arrives. TLI Cornejo has received this assignment. It is now her job to unravel the incident and to begin to gather information as to the probable cause. In a crash of this magnitude, she has the assistance of multiple NTSB staff members. Okay, that was uh, Jeff. Uh, so he says that you're going to hold a briefing with all of your NTSB support. We'll make a game plan. Maybe we can use the uh, command post. Yeah, I'm going to have to. I got to go see. Okay. So just make sure everything gets Okay, so uh, follow the boss. When an accident happens, the first people on scene are emergency responders. Very soon thereafter, the NTSB will come to the scene. We have the lead in any investigation of a transportation accident. We go in as an independent agency and we make our determination of the probable cause of the accident based on facts, science, and data. We determine what happened, and then from that, we issue a recommendation or a series of recommendations on how to prevent that in the future. Is this still a crime scene? It is, at this point, yeah. From the very first moments, NTSB investigators are looking for clues to the probable cause of the accident. The story that we got before we left was a plane departed Santa Monica. They did the handoff from departure, and they never came up on the handoff. 
I'm Councilman Jack Weiss, and I just want to say it's a horrifying scene in this neighborhood. We are mandated by Congress to investigate all aircraft accidents, and we're mandated by Congress to head up those investigations. So basically, we have primacy, and all the other government agencies are basically working for the NTSB at the accident scene. That includes the FAA, that includes the FBI, uh, if it's not a criminal activity. I have not seen FBI, I've seen everybody else. No, I've met FBI. Oh, Taylor has met FBI. I've met FBI. And the first job of an NTSB investigator is to seek out the incident commander. So we're going to be here to support you, sir. I don't know what you need right now. We're dewatering that area. They know that the FAA and the NTSB have a lot of expertise in aviation crashes, so they're more than happy to turn over the accident site to us after they've determined that it's safe. Yeah, so about 30 minutes before. I'd rather do that than just jump in. And At a high-profile crash site, Part of the task the NTSB must face is providing information to the news media who gather. Mr. Pollock, could you determine the angle of descent of the aircraft? I understand from witnesses that the airplane was reportedly in a steep descent. We'll make an assessment as to the manner in which the aircraft will be removed from the structure. As soon as the fire department stabilizes the building from collapse, then the NTSB will, with its resources, uh, attempt to uh, uh, have the aircraft extricated and we'll be able to do the structural examination. When that will not be done today. Can you go ahead and tell me what you guys have up to this point? Well, the thing, what we know now is that the aircraft came from Santa Monica Airport. It did depart from there. When a large response is required, the lead investigator calls together officials from both the NTSB and the FAA. This is a chance to check and cross-check the facts emerging from a confusing day and to seek further information needed to begin assembling the pieces of this puzzle. We need the radar track and then any kind of uh, flight service station briefing that he may have received on uh, communication tapes. So soon. With night falling and the building still unstable, entering the structure is out of the question. But reviewing the information gathered that day is vital. I have one witness who saw the airplane flying straight and level, said the nose pitched up 90 degrees and the aircraft started climbing. He lost the aircraft in the clouds. And then the next thing he saw was um, the airplane coming back down in a nose down attitude, headed towards the ground and spinning. The role of the NTSB field investigator is critical to the success of the NTSB mission. They're an amazing combination of uh, an emergency responder, Sherlock Holmes, a forensic investigator, a little bit of an engineer, a little bit of a scientist, and people who are dedicated with their heart and their head and their hands. The next morning, the site of the crash is calm. NTSB focus becomes the removal of the wreckage. We're working on it as fast as we can. This might take a couple days. Who knows? I don't want it to, but you know. If it takes a couple days, I need to know because I need to, we need to ask him to stay. The LAPD maintains that security. Okay. Even in the midst of the most unpleasant phase of the recovery, the NTSB focuses on its tasks, part of which includes media relations. How confident are you given the conditions here at the building that you'll be able to piece together the cause of this accident? Um, that, that's going to be the big question until we can get everything out of the, um, out of the structure and make sure that we have everything that we're going to need. Um, that's yet to be determined. Okay. During the cleanup and removal operation, no clues have surfaced as to the cause of the crash. The next step will take place away from the city. The aircraft salvage yard outside Los Angeles is a graveyard of aviation filled with questions. It is here that NTSB investigators must coax important answers from these silent ghosts. Today we're looking at the uh, wreckage from the uh, airplane accident. What we did this morning was lay out the wreckage um, and try and find um, 
the major components, wings, tail, uh, flight controls, uh, avionics, instruments, and we're basically trying to put the airplane back together again so that we can uh, see modes of failure with the aircraft. Modes of failure are looked at very carefully when we do the wreckage examination. And what we're looking at is we're looking at the way the pieces separated from one another, whether the fractures are suspicious, what the load paths were in the structure. We're looking at how it bent, how it separated, how it broke. What if we get the engine over to the side here? When NTSB investigators arrive at the scene of the Hollywood crash, they find nothing to indicate its cause. Now, sifting carefully through what remains, they first focus on any clue that might point to a mechanical failure of the aircraft. The engine itself, uh, we're just doing a, a basic visual inspection of it. We're going to take the spark plugs out. And what we'll do with the engine uh, is go ahead and we'll box it up and send it to uh, Mobile, Alabama, where we'll have a uh, further uh, teardown of the engine under more controlled conditions. In the layout, there was no mechanical issues noted when we, we did a visual inspection of the engine, um, which re included removing the spark plugs. It was all involved in a fire, but for the most part, everything appeared to be where it was supposed okay, to be. And we have our control system accounted Control for. systems accounted for. You have to look at every every piece, you know, how is the, the seat frame um, bent, which way is it bent, or is it all together? You can't even tell this is an airplane um, from outside perspective. So, you know, that's what's left of my fuselage right there. Is what, you, what you see is what's left. In addition to potential mechanical failures, investigators look at human factors that could have contributed to the accident. So let's look at his logbook and see. After the fact, typo. Kind of looks like it, doesn't it? The um, FAA inspectors, they come out and, and they help us as well. I didn't know you had the license, too. We don't generate the same type of information that the NTSB does. They'll, they'll go and get a probable cause. They'll find out what happened. We do nine areas of responsibilities that, that we're looking at to see. And, and some of those things are like pilot certification, uh, pilot training, uh, maintenance issues. We would possibly pursue an enforcement on people that were involved in the accident. Uh, for example, if a, a, a part malfunctioned and we go back in time and find out that part was improperly serviced, that might be, end up becoming a probable cause that the NTSB would cite. But what we'll do is then we'll take action against whatever entity or organization might have had that problem. There's a lot of uh, back, background work that we're going to have to do. The fact that it came down in a, in a nose down attitude, it causes a lot of concern because we have to try and find a, a probable cause as to why it did that. Even after careful examination of the aircraft wreckage, the NTSB cannot yet isolate the specific cause of the crash but their investigation eliminates factors that might have led to the tragedy. None of the witnesses reported hearing any sputtering. They said that the engine sounded very loud. Um, There's nothing abnormal with the, with the autopsy. Um, the medical examiner asked him you know, to take a look at the heart, and he said he'd do a, a macroscopic inspection of the heart, and he didn't find anything abnormal. The major part of the um, investigation will now I have to complete my weather. All right, so we're waiting for weather, and then we have a radar study in process? The radar study is in okay. process, and all that stuff. With no signs of mechanical failure and no abnormalities in the pilot autopsy, the investigation seeks assistance from NTSB laboratories in Washington, D.C. On the Monday following the accident, the investigator in charge uh, needed some air traffic control assistance. So what I did is I asked the FAA and I put in a request for radar data and voice communications. And once I received them, I review them and analyze them and provide the investigator in charge with uh, information regarding air traffic control services. Uh, we have uh, software programs that we import the uh, radar extraction and we can visually see the radar track. The black squares are the actual radar track of this aircraft. Right, and this wreckage site is the triangle. And so that now they can get to see a visual as to the streets that the uh, track of uh, the aircraft was uh, approximately flying over. Some of the factual information that I found on the voice recordings was uh, first the pilot did contact Hawthorne Flight Service Station for a weather briefing. He actually contacted the flight service three uh, 
different times throughout the day on that Friday of the accident. He was very interested in when the weather was going to clear. Have you heard of any clearing east today? No, I haven't heard anything. That's... Okay, well, I'm going to try to get out of here around Ontario and pop up through this. So there's supposed to be some broken, lake, broken stuff out there. So uh, let me out whenever you can. That day, uh, we had the typical June gloom weather pattern here in the Los Angeles Basin, where we had uh, a stratus cloud deck with uh, bases that were around uh, 3,000 feet and tops uh, somewhere in the 4,000 foot range. Uh, the briefings all indicated that it was marginal VFR and that the clearing was not occurring as quickly as they had anticipated. It was going to happen later on in the day. The pilot waits at the airport for the weather to clear. He has a VFR, visual flight rating, and is not certified to fly by instruments through inclement weather or at night. But after eight hours, he decides to fly. Bonanza 1856 Papa, Santa Monica ground, taxi to runway 21. 56 Papa, clear for takeoff, I'll be staying under 3,000 feet. Uh, the aircraft did depart Santa Monica airport and uh, departed uh, to the northeast. Okay, I'm just staying low here till I get to uh, see some sky somewhere. Ready. And that he was going to uh, try to pop out out of the clouds. Santa Monica Tower, Bonanza 1856 Papa. Can I get a frequency change? Thank you, frequency change for 56 Papa. See you later. And then we have the witnesses saw him climb up into the clouds and then come spinning down. Well, an airplane only spins when, when it stalls. Aerodynamically, that has to happen. It's one, two. A stall is an aerodynamic phenomenon in which an aircraft loses lift, the most fundamental principle of flight. Reducing airspeed and angles of ascent are among the most common causes of stalls. In a very short period of time, he went from 2,600 feet to 3,100 feet to 3,300 feet. In fact, the radar return data shows that this aircraft ascended 1,100 feet in just 14 seconds. I had a weather study done from about eight hours previous to the accident to the accident time. I had cloud bases overcast anywhere from 2,200 to 3,300 feet in the area. As the pilot enters the cloud layers, attempting to pop out the top, his vision is obscured and his senses are fooled. Our eyes are very important to us. The visual cues are very important to keeping our orientation. Now, if we take away the visual cues, right, you no longer have any visual references outside, then that's how the brain gets confused about its spatial orientation to the, to the Earth. The pilot enters the clouds. He cannot tell up from down. The plane climbs at too steep an angle, loses lift then plummets to the ground. We as air safety investigators are responsible for collecting the facts, conditions, and circumstances of the accident. We are considered staff and we present our findings in terms of facts, conditions, and circumstances to the five members of the safety board. They are really the only ones that are allowed to adopt what the opinion and the probable cause uh, of the accident is. In this case, uh, staff recommended to the board uh, a cause of, of an in-flight loss of control due to spatial disorientation. America first learned of spatial disorientation in the John Kennedy Jr. crash investigation. And uh, typically those accidents are fatal. It's significant enough where our agency is, has just initiated a, a special study into uh, uh, trying to find out what are some of the human factors involved with the decisions that pilots make in entering these kinds of uh, hazardous weather conditions. Each accident is unique. It's not, you just don't pull out the book and open it up and say, accident X, Y, Z, and this is the checklist for it. Each one is unique. What sort of evidence are we looking for? And what does it mean? As the Western Regional Director of the NTSB, Jeff Rich is charged with training air safety inspectors from across the country in investigative techniques and strategies. Actually, I, uh, I really like uh, the part of my job that uh, involves mentoring new, new ASIs. I enjoy training the new people and working with them. See, you're, you're thinking one event. Right. Think multiple events. 
I only got three brain cells going. <laughs> it's, it's like working a huge jigsaw puzzle where somebody's taking the, uh, the box picture off. You know, the cover of the box where you got the photo of what it's supposed to look like. That's gone. Somebody's taken the box and dumped it. Remember when we laid this down? Watch right. here. Right. Right. Watch what personality trait makes a good air safety investigator? Having a, uh, an inquiring mind. The ability to learn very quickly. They have to enjoy doing puzzles. From the barest bits of information, investigators learn to determine cause. The accident occurred about 1300. Both airplanes were in contact with the tower. The twin was departing. The uh, single was inbound. Controller had said, twin, you have the single entering downwind. Uh, single, you have the twin. We got no acknowledgment from either airplane. Immediately after that, the controller noticed the collision. What we're looking for right now on the aircraft is any marks or paint that we can correlate with the other aircraft. We are starting to see significant signatures like paint transfers on the propeller of this Mooney, blue paint, and there's no blue paint on this aircraft, so that'd be an indication that it came from somewhere else. We've got a two blade strikes here, and that was equal to the same width as the spar. Uh, pretty significant find. It gives us an approximate angle in, in the fact that the propeller on the uh, Mooney aircraft uh, sliced through the wing off of the Duchess aircraft and sliced through the spar. We can get an angle off of that. Do you see that? The first mm -hmm. time you can mentally reassemble that puzzle and understand the way the vehicle got there and the energy path, it's the biggest endorphin I can, I can think of. And it's an even bigger thrill when you can do something about it. What I get out of this job is that if by finding out what happened in the accident, I can prevent somebody else from making the same mistake, those types of things is what, what I'm trying to make a difference in. Patrick Jones is a relative newcomer to the NTSB. He is currently in his training phase as a staff investigator. Patrick is actually fine with the investigations. And I know that sometimes there's serious crashes and you know there's death involved and he actually used to be a police officer years ago and I think that he can do the job and detach himself enough and then be with his family separately. The individual investigators this job it interferes with their family life it interferes with uh, personal plans you're on at the whim of the pager and a cell phone 24-7 for your entire career. This is our uh, communication center. Uh, we stood this up back in 1997. It's manned 24 hours a day. A local law enforcement officer will call the NTSB communication center here and say, there's been an aircraft accident in my state, in my county. These folks know exactly who is on duty in each of our 10 offices. So the comm center sends a page out. The page is received by the investigator with some basic information about an airplane that crashed in their territory. From there, a dialogue begins. Be upstairs. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The pager informs Patrick that a fatal crash has occurred near Santa Barbara and that he has been selected for the first time as the lead investigator. Do we know what time it happened? A single-engine plane crashes in the hills north of Santa Barbara. Unlike the crash in Hollywood, there are no eyewitnesses or radar reports to help NTSB investigators. You'll be surprised what's here. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of material. All right, why don't you leave the way since you've been up there working? Well, the reason we're out here, of course, is to, uh, is to examine the, uh, the wreckage to see if we can find any airworthiness concerns uh, so that we can begin to formulate the cause. Patrick Jones receives his first major assignment as the lead investigator to this crash. Jeff Rich, the NTSB Western Regional Director, acts as his mentor on site. See the big tree? It's got a, it's got a break up high. Yeah. And, and there's a, another broken uh, branch um, that's about mid-level. Well, then the, all the other stuff is down low. So we had to be in some kind of a banked attitude. Okay, now, do we have any parts up here? No. Okay. 
This part of the investigation is all fact-finding. Right now, we're trying to ascertain uh, the way the airplane got here, which will help us determine whether it was in control or out of control. Uh, if, for example, it's out of control, then our, our real major concern is the control system. If it appears that the airplane was in control, then our focus becomes more in the power generation area. What do we think of this? There on that leading edge. It's amazing what even this mess will tell us. If, you, if you're patient enough to listen to it, if you sit and look at it long enough, it shouts volumes at you to how the airplane went through the, went through the trees. So if we look at that, um, see, and this thing is inverted. Yeah, it's inverted. That wing is upside down. Yeah, it's upside down. You see, there's where the lift strut attaches. In fact, we see inspection panel. There's one. Remnants of one. No hinges. So just offhand, I say this wing is upside down. OK, then that makes this the right wing. The right wing. Okay. The, the crush lines represent, of course, the impact. Okay. And we see right there that crush mark is a is a witness of the actual impact, and uh, it will tell us exactly the pitch attitude and the roll attitude of the airplane. And in this case, it looks like the airplane was pretty much wings level and in, uh, in somewhat of a uh, a level pitch attitude as well. Why don't? Uh... Why don't we start with these control cables? There's only about 47 to 50 air safety investigators spread across the country. And those 50 investigators are basically charged with investigating nearly 2,000 aircraft accidents a year. Of that 2,000, maybe a third involve fatalities in which we actually launch to the accident site. Want to have an idea of where those pulleys are? You want to pay attention to the cable runs in, in the areas where the pulleys would be. They have to be well versed enough to know what's important and what isn't for the investigation. And then they zero in on that and come up with a proposed uh, probable cause. You know, I went through that, the initial tree in a controlled attitude. Right now, the focus is shifting to uh, some sort of a power issue. We're typically on scene for. Uh, two or three days for your general general aviation accident. Then the hard part begins. We go back to the office and we begin all of the follow-up investigation. We interview witnesses. We obtain radar data. We collect weather information. We uh, delve into the history of the pilot. The people who I who had interviewed who had flown with him indicated that it was a, a pretty tight strip to get in and out of. Um, and he had... Um, on previous occasions, um, scraped wingtips. Good heavens. And this is how wide? Um, it's approximately 50 feet wide. The wingspan's 36. Not a whole lot to play with. No. And our accident site is just down over those bushes, right? Yes. Right off the end. And the distance from the end of the runway to this to the accident site was? 440 feet. 440 feet, OK. This is the departure end of the runway. It bushes that the bushes that were shaved off at about uh, wingtip height. Okay, you can see that flat area right there. And that red lens was found? Off to the left. Off here. to the left of that, yeah. okay. Yeah. It was about 181 feet from the departure end of the runway. Um, this is a sideways view, which right, doesn't there's help. Our lens there's your right. red lens. On the left wing at the accident site, the lens was missing, right? Correct. So do we have any other outstanding work areas for this? No. Um, okay. Basically, everything seems to be in place and uh, pretty, pretty much should be able to wrap it up. OK, good. When the NTSB investigator is satisfied that he or she has documented the perishable evidence, uh, they'll give the green light to have that wreckage uh, scooped up. And it's taken to uh, typically a, uh, a sheltered, uh, locked, hangar in case there's future examinations required. The NTSB and the FAA want an airplane brought back to a, a secure area that, that 
it's not controlled by the owner or the insurance company or the manufacturer they want it in, a, in, a, in an area that's not influenced by any of those parties so we'll bring the airplanes back to this hangar where they can do their investigation and afterward the insurance company they'll pay me to store these aircraft until they figure out what it what they're going to do with them wings were just steve smalley wings. operates air and sea crash recovery out of palm beach florida though his work takes him all over the world his primary focus is within the southeastern united states and the caribbean he works closely with the ntsb usually what happens is an airplane will crash in a given area, say in the Everglades, and I'll get a call from an insurance representative and they'll say, Steve, we've had an accident. You need to uh, get our airplane out of wherever it is. And I'll be on the way to the scene immediately. Okay, where is it? In about sure. the time it took me to drive the accident, I had an idea of what I needed and I started to put those people and those resources in place. Yeah, Chris, it's Steve. I need your helicopter. I've got one up here in the cow field, and it's absolutely, totally inaccessible. In this geographical area of the United States, there's a lot of water, there's a lot of Everglades, there's a lot of swamp. So it's 50-50 that an airplane, if it's going to go down, it's going to go down in either a swamp or some water. All right, let's, uh... I'm going to take, I'm going to go out with the insurance guy. Okay. We'll lace up the, the wreck, call for the helicopter. That's all we can do. I coordinated with the sheriff's liaison and the fire rescue people, and they took me out to the accident. Yeehaw Junction, Florida, where the aircraft goes down, is along the region's busiest flight path. The marshes could only be crossed by airboat. Because there is no stable ground for the chopper to land, Smalley and his crew travel ahead to prepare the downed plane for removal. we're going to try to get straps around the, the large pieces of this fuselage. This piece, this piece, whatever, whatever we think is going to break away, we're going to put another strap around it. So when the helicopter comes in, even though it comes, it starts to pull apart, at least we'll be able to pull it all out. And I, I don't want a whole lot of pieces of the, this wreckage dropping all off into the, the forest or the swamp on the way back, so we have to, we'll have to go and get it. Returning every piece of the aircraft to the hangar is crucial to the active NTSB investigation. The single greatest cause of why airplanes go down has something to do with the human element, the pilot. Uh, it, at least in terms of general aviation, the smaller airplanes. Uh, a big killer is, uh, again, VFR flight into IMC. Good weather pilots that fly into bad weather. Weather-related accidents kills a lot of general aviation pilots. People don't realize how, how, how strong these thunderstorms are when they fly into them. It seems like it's OK. They've been in weather before, and they fly into one of these things. and. Yeah, the orange trees are split right open. I mean, it just tore the tail right off of this airplane. It's just amazing. It just never ceases to amaze me about what the weather can do to these little airplanes. The location of a downed aircraft can make a recovery operation extremely complex. But when a plane is submerged in the Caribbean waters five miles from the mainland, the task is daunting. Six miles off the coast of Marathon, in the Florida Keys, an eight-passenger plane goes down. Before the NTSB can continue their investigation, the aircraft must be taken to dry land. So it's really important that we get the airplane from where it is back to the shore without doing any damage to it. On February 20th, pilot Dennis Murphy encounters an in-flight fire. He tries desperately to control it, 
In the end, he makes a critical decision that saves his life. I decided the best way to put it in the ocean and put the fire out. I was just uh, scared hitting that water, you know. I did my best to slow the airplane down to, uh, as much as possible for, before hitting that water. Within hours, he is rescued by a passing fisherman and makes it home with only minor injuries. Now the plane sits under 35 feet of water. It's tied to that orange buoy. We're going to put all three of these boats together. We're going to raft them side by side, make one big platform. Shark big Mike will go down first, make sure there's nothing really big down there that can bite us, get pictures of the airplane. Then the rest of us will go in the water and we'll try to put the straps on it. Then we'll lower the flotation bags, hook those up to the straps, inflate those flotation bags, and slowly it'll come up like Moby Dick. Yeah. This is about as high tech as a, an aircraft recovery can get. I mean, it, if you look at real closely at some of the equipment that these guys have, it is absolutely state of the art. These guys brought all the toys, and we're going to need them. These divers can stay down with this equipment for three, four hours. I don't think, I don't anticipate that the, that the dive and the uh, the attaching the flotation system to this fuselage is going to take much longer than an hour, hour and a half. But we'll just have to see once we get out there. First, the wreck is surveyed for stability to ensure the safety of the divers. At the same time, they assess any immediate threats to the delicate marine ecosystem. Small pieces are secured first. Divers talk with the surface crew through modules in their helmets. Their first communications relay information about ocean conditions. Uh, they had good visibility. A lot of current that they're fighting. That's going to be a little problem there. One of the engines is completely uh, ripped off the plane, just held on by some uh, cables, and they're trying to secure that engine. Straps are placed on the strongest structural points of the craft, while airbags are prepared. These bags are key in raising the plane from the ocean floor. It takes the utmost effort from all the divers to correctly secure the bags to the straps. The bags must be precisely situated. Once they are secured, it is difficult to change their position. Not only are they used to lift the aircraft, but also to keep it on a level position all the way to shore. Yeah, they're filling up all the airbags now. Get the plane up. Hopefully, right side up. And we'll see what happens. Care is taken to avoid damage to the structure. This will ensure the best possible condition for NTSB investigators. Bags are inflated slowly and evenly to bring the four-ton aircraft to neutral buoyancy. One mistake could result in the plane tipping over, or worse, breaking into pieces. With the nose of the aircraft cresting the surface, divers slowly inflate the bag strapped to the tail. As the craft rises, neutral buoyancy is reached. The plane now hovers in the right position just below the surface. People don't realize that you really don't want an airplane this size to float up on top of the water. That's a very big airplane. That's 50, the wings are 50 some feet. The airplane's probably 42 feet long from nose to tail. As long as it stays underwater, see, it stabilizes itself. It doesn't rock as much as if it was on the surface. This is Scott from Air and Sea Recovery. I got the uh, aircraft under tow, and uh, we're en route.
As you can see, it's just about sunset and they're just about to make this turn. The biggest part of this deal was having to tow it at one knot per hour. Wish we could have been this far an hour before, so we'd have an hour of daylight. What can you do? This is it's what it's all about. This is what, this is what we do. Yeah. None of them just swim up to the dock and jump into the boat or jump on the side. They, you got to fight them and tickle them and beat them, strap them. He's going to pick up on it, ease it in, pick up on it, ease it in. The closer it gets to the crane, the more lift he has. But he's got it now, and it's still full of water, still pouring out of it. Back on the shore, it's placed on jacks for NTSB investigators to complete their work by daylight. The plane will then be broken down and stored until final disposition of the aircraft is determined. When a general aviation accident occurs, an investigator is launched alone, armed with preliminary information from the FAA and law enforcement en route to the scene. On a busy holiday weekend, the call comes for Patrick Jones. When he arrives at the impact area, he finds that the initial evidence on the ground shows something completely different from all the information he'd been given. This fatal crash of a vintage aircraft occurred in the Hollywood Hills. The craft impacted at the bottom of a steep ravine surrounded by multi-million dollar estates. In such tragic circumstances, NTSB investigator Patrick Jones must simultaneously control access to the accident scene, preserve evidence as best he can, and supervise the retrieval. This time, he is on his own, with no senior investigator at his side. We were notified that uh, at about uh, 12.25 um, today, a uh, T-28 uh, Charlie, which is a North American uh, World War II trainer, uh, departed from uh, Van Nuys Airport uh, on its way to Thermal, California. It had not gotten far in the flight uh, when it, it crashed into this, this location, which is a pretty deep ravine. Um, we believe that we have two uh, uh, persons that were on board, um, and they were both fatal. Um, the aircraft is pretty well broken up. Uh, not pretty well. It's destroyed. The unusual thing was is that that the Van Nuys is over here. The the impact crater is is relatively here, and all of the energy is is this way. It's right. to the north. So the energy is going back towards the airport. Yeah. Part of what you're trying to do on scene is determine that all of the aircraft got to the accident scene around the same time versus if you're traveling 150 miles an hour and you lose a wing it's going to be a long ways away from the accident site versus if you find all of the pieces you know the left wing the right wing the rudder the tail the you know all the major big pieces in one place then the aircraft probably was in one piece at the time of the accident yeah, I was just thinking underneath, just let it run under there a little bit. On the wing tips, they have lights which denote whether it's the right or the left wing. And that way you can tell an airplane coming at you whether it's which way it is, whether it's coming at you or going away from you. This is the red lens. That in itself doesn't mean anything, but it's just one more corner of, of what I'm looking for to make sure that the aircraft all got here at one time. The, the hard part at this point is going to be getting an idea who it is. If, uh, once we get an idea, then we've got a direction to go. Uh, with, with, if we have no idea who it is, you know, it's, uh, you can take a DNA sample and hold it, but you've got to have something to compare it to. When you're doing the on-scene stuff, you have to do it based on um, that you're never going to see it again. 
How are you guys doing? We got as much as... Yeah, I get. think we've done pretty much uh, what we can do for tonight because we're getting ready to lose light. Uh, besides, I've, I've got to do some sifting and, uh, and raking in here. The area is secured and monitored overnight by law enforcement. In the morning, crews resume their work. They will need to find a way to get the remains of the plane and the crew out of the ravine. As I understand it, the uh, uh, plane is on top of the uh, body at this time, so we're going to be going down to assess uh, how we can remove the plane with as little damage as possible and uh, see if we can get the body out. When you have a, uh, an accident that's this total, um, bits and pieces can mean a lot or they can mean nothing it, and you have to you have to take it all in and a lot of this is is just trying to recover it all um, we documented the way everything was sitting before we we uh, started disturbing stuff so are we going to have trouble reconstructing his instrument experience in the t28 um particularly the recent experience yes we are the accessories on the on the back of this motor were just spread out in little tiny pieces um, so it'll be very problematic to reconstruct. Yes. Um, we, we found um, very few instruments um, that were discernible as, as anything. Um, so a typical high energy, very high energy, vertical impact. The scar on the, uh, on the ground kind of supports that, that impact theory. But, most of it is just gathering up Good the pieces and then trying to, to methodically look at where it goes on the aircraft and then try to assess the, the damage that, that you've observed. The information originally received suggested that the plane was heading away from the airport. However, the impact scar at the crash site tells a different story. This discrepancy leads investigators to suspect that the pilot was getting incorrect information, either from his instruments or from his own senses. In uh, both the, the Fairfax crash and in the, uh, in the Mulholland crash, uh, the grunt investigative work, what that did was exclude mechanical or system failures. The only thing left were the, were the anomalies that we see that lead us to believe that, uh, that a spatial disorientation was involved in both. In this case, the staff recommends to the board in Washington that the crash occurred due to pilot's loss of control. This was brought on by spatial disorientation. A possible factor in this was distraction caused to the pilot in the adjustment of his flight instruments. In the world of aviation safety, Accident investigators and their support staff are called into action where they must work to avoid future tragedy, both in the air and on the ground. The further we test our technology and power, the more we test our bodies and our senses. For as long as we attempt to go beyond our known limits, there will always be the need for systems of safety and investigation.